Good afternoon, my name is Corey, and I'd like to welcome you to the 14th year of the Citrus Research Exchange Seminar Series. Uh, over the years, we have hosted a remarkable lineup of technology innovators in person, and are glad to see you all joining us virtually today for the Spring 2020 Series. And today, so today I'd like to introduce Dr. Misha Pavel. Dr. Pavel holds a joint faculty appointment in Northeastern's Cowrie College of Computer Sciences and Bouvet College of Health Sciences. And he is a faculty, visiting faculty at UC Davis as part of the Healthy Aging and a Digital World Initiative. His background comprises electrical engineering, computer science, and experimental psychology. His research includes multi-scale dynamic computational modeling of behaviors and psychological states with applications ranging from elder care to augmentation of human performance. Pavel uses these model-based approaches to develop algorithms transforming unobtrusive monitoring from smart homes and mobile devices to practical and actionable knowledge for diagnosis and intervention. Under the auspices of the Northeastern Base Consortium on Technology for Proactive Care, Pavel and his colleagues target technological innovations to support the development of economically feasible, proactive, distributed, and individual-centered healthcare. In addition, doc, uh, Dr. Pavel is investigating approaches for inferring and augmenting human cognition using computer games, EEG, gait characteristics, and transcranial electrical stimulation. Prior to his current positions, he was a program director at the National Science Foundation, faculty at NYU, OHSU, and Stanford University, and a member of the technical staff at Bell Laboratories. It is my great honor to welcome Misha Pavel. Thank, thank you, Corey, for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, I'm very honored and thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, I'm going to, my, my talk follows a talk that was uh, given by Holly Jimison, a colleague, uh, two weeks ago. And so I'm going to briefly review the coaching system she described, but then we focus on, on quantitative computational modeling and its role in this field. So we start with measurements models. We will talk about how frequently do we need to sample, especially for intensive longitudinal health data, which is the current uh, direction that the field is going. And then we look at uh, various aspects of models and give some example of models with discrete states and dynamic models, both in physics and behaviors. And then Incorporate, uh, then I give another example of the, how we use principles to combine with measurements to make a better assessment. The idea is that we focusing on behaviors because behaviors happen to be very critical in our lives and they account for most, uh, for the largest proportion of the, say, premature mortality, but also quality of life, as you may imagine. We can't do anything about the genetic, but we can certainly hope to do something about behaviors. But as you know from experience, most of us find that ha ha bad habits are easy to acquire, but very hard to lose. That's why we need something to help us. And here is the uh, overall picture that Holly presented two weeks ago. We are focused on the individual. A lot of our focus is, is on older adults, but it's applicable to, uh, to younger adults uh, and, uh, and uh, those with some uh, ailments. The idea is to put the patient in the center and individualized. It's very important that all of that I'm going to do is based on trying to look at individuals, both modeling and in, the, in their intervention. We monitor the individual with as much data as we can, and that's the result of recent advances in sensors and computing technology. We, and uh, we use those data to 
together with inference algorithms, figure out what's going on with that, and then use, use that in a coaching system that's based on artificial intelligence kind of rules and, and techniques. So when you look at this diagram, you immediately realize that there is a lot of measurement going on. We have to be able to assess the uh, state of the individual. And so we measure with sensors. We measure with uh, their responses on, on a computer, on a phone. We look at their voice and so on and so forth. But what is measurement though? It's interesting, many people that have not thought about measurement as any really uh, theoretically very important area. And there, are, there is a measurement theory in mathematical psychology. So say, say um, you are interested in some phenomenon and you want to uh, convert it to numbers. That's what we usually mean by measurement, but it's not any numbers. They have to obey some uh, principles that enable us to make some inferences about the phenomena. But in general, it's a mapping. But in practice, it's actually a transformation where the sensors take some phenomena that you may be interested in and transform it into numbers like weight or blood pressure or what have you. Now, then we can use, if we have to under, if we understand this transformation, you can advert it and make inferences about the phenomena. And that's where measurement benefits us. But take a very simple example, body mass. How can you measure body mass? Well, there's no way to measure body mass directly. However, you can use the model that's created a number of years ago by Newton, which converts mass into force by, by the means of gravity of Earth. But unfortunately, we can't measure force directly either. So you have to use a couple of other laws, for example, the balance uh, law, or, or you can use something like called Hooke's law or something similar that would be in your electric scales. In any case, it's model-based. And even though you never may think about it, it's very important to understand what those transformations are. In fact, most phenomena you cannot measure directly take cardiovascular system, you can't measure it, but you can measure blood pressure or EKG. And we, we are not really interested in blood pressure, but the blood pressure is indicative of the state of the cardiovascular system. And we can make those inferences. So this is important to understand. And especially important when you're dealing with people's responses to questions. And you know, psychologists have for years, since 1932, like what we call Likert scale. You can rate your uh, experiences, feelings, or what have you on this scale, five point scale, seven point scale, where suppose you were asked to rate your stress. What do you think a, a person is doing? Well, you need to understand that. What is the mapping between that state that's in somebody's head and the number that they give you? In particular, that's affected is that number is affected by a number of things, not just their state, but also by responses, by context and previous uh, experiences. So typically there is a randomness involved that in the same conditions, people don't give you the same numbers. And that has to be taken into account when you actually analyze these scales. And, the, and the even more complicated is situation when you ask people to um, to summarize the effects over time. So if you ask people how stressed were you in the last hour, well, this, these data are uh, skin conductance, which kind of reflects uh, stress to some extent, and it varies quite a bit over time. So how do people summarize? Well, it turns out they don't quite average, even if you ask them to average, they can't do that. And, and there are some interesting, almost funny situations that I don't have time to go into. Um, how frequently do you ask about something? Well, it depends on how, what is the dynamics of the phenomena. So 
if you ask people about birth date, at least for most part of the life, it's constant. Eventually, as you get older, it gets changed, but, uh, but initially it's pretty constant. So you just have to ask once. Hate may, maybe once a year. Um, although you need to understand that during the initial stages of life increases, then it stays constant, but then it starts decreasing. So understanding how quickly that changes, it gives you the idea how often to sample and so on. The glucose, uh, HB, A1C, maybe every couple of months or three months, but glucose, uh, glucose in blood level, you need to maybe two or three times a day if you are diabetic. Uh, weight, if you uh, maybe once a day, if, especially if you have a heart condition that, uh, that accumulates, uh, leads to accumulation of fluid. Self-efficacy several times a day, about cognition? Well, we heard cognition maybe once a year. Well, it's not the case. Cognition varies quite a bit. And self-efficacy, the, the ability or to the uh, feeling that you can achieve something. For me, self-efficacy starts very high in the morning. And by the time I get to noon, I realize that I'm not going to accomplish what I wanted to. Now, if you measure it just once a day, at say at 8 a.m., you may get a curve that looks like it's straightforward, that things are not changing, even though they are changing. If you actually measure every 13 hours, just for now, you see a completely different curve. These curves, these errors that are caused by sampling are in engineering called aliasing, and they can be only eliminated by sampling fast enough. And the sampling fast enough is twice the highest frequency that, uh, that's in the, uh, in the signal. So those are all parts of measurement and understanding how to, how to do this. Now, back to cognition, because that's what my, uh, my main interests are. Cognition is, has been traditionally tested very rarely, maybe once a year at best, and maybe not even that. And the tests that were developed and norm across thousands of people are static, usually paper and pencil, but even if they are presented on computer, they are constant. Then cannot be used frequently enough to, to see the variability. So the other problem with the traditional tests is that when you analyze the task of the test, you realize that there are multiple cognitive processes that need to operate in, con in collaboration. To, to produce the effect the results. And that creates a confusion about what the test results really mean. Now, introducing random variations could help this. How could we do that? Well, perhaps we can measure with games. And we've done this, but because games introduce randomness, so we can, we can um, uh, expose people to games uh, frequently and some people play like our grandkids we cannot take them away from games um, and they are random enough so that they would be motivating but the scores depend depends on the randomness depends on the situation so in order to interpret those scores we need to develop model that can subtract or split apart the effect that's due to the game variation, the effects due to cognitive variation. So you can ask, well, how to do that? Well, there's machine learning, of course, we could do that, right? So machine learning is, uh, is a good thing if uh, it has been very successful. And what usually you do is take a big uh, training set and uh, try to figure out what the patterns are, what the features, uh, uh, relationship among features is now the problem is that uh, these statistical machine learning models are relatively agnostic to the actual underlying processes that you are trying to measure and because of that they entirely depend on training set and that led to the recent realization that if you have biased uh, training set uh, you will be 
have a biased result, especially because machine learning focuses on optimization of averages. Now, but I am a particular individual, and this is my nephew who is half Czech, half Thai. And this is now a step, a step to the other. And he is biracial. It's probably not quite represented. And I, I'm usually way off the, the mean. So I'm not represented in any of these tests and uh, uh, training sets. So biases can only be truly eliminate. Of course we can help and I'm, I'm all for trying to make those training set as inclusive as possible. But ultimately, the idea is to understand the individuals and that, uh, that's how we can uh, make inferences about uh, individuals. And therefore that we need really models of how results of the measure relates to the underlying processes. So that's the goal of what I'm trying to do. Now, I, I just wanna give you another view of this from, the, from a, a little bit of a scientific approach, um, looking at uh, astronomy. Now, some uh, uh, 2000 some years ago, almost, almost exactly 2000, 2200 or something like that, Ptolemy came up with a model that uh, was reflecting some observations in the sky, like retrograde motion. It was a complex model, but it was probably the most successful model uh, in, in, in science because it lasted 1500 years. And it wasn't until Copernicus that figured out that the retrograde motion can actually be caused by relative motion of two planets around the sun. Now, unfortunately, his model was not ever even near as good as the Ptolemies. And uh, of course, the, there was a lot of uh, discussion about religion at that time, which caused a lot of problems. But Tycho de Brahe started collecting data. He has got huge amounts of measurement, big data, first big data on stars and planets. And Kepler then was able to deduce this possibility that uh, that these circles are not uh, circles but ellipses, and see, what what we have done is uh, over the uh, civilization, and we, I mean humans, is to move from the pure observation to to be developing the laws, and Galilei discovered the moons of Jupiter, and uh, that gave another idea of what may be happening in the sky. But it wasn't until Newton that you could take arbitrary object that is not in your training set, give it, measure its position and velocity and figure out exactly what, what the um, trajectory will be. Now, what, what is the relationship among all these models that have been used? Well, there are some purely statistical data-driven black box models. The original science was just classification they're based on distributions correlations. They have no, they don't incorporate actually the mechanism as long, but they do if, if it is consistent with this in, uh, uh, internal constraints of those models. Then eventually there are models that are uh, based on invariances and dimensional analysis, which I'm not going to spend any time, but they just, for example, linearity. You may not know what the system is, but if you know it's linear, it gives you a huge benefit in understanding how to measure it, how to uh, characterize it. And then, of course, have the phenomenologistic and the mechanistic models like Newton's laws. These range from the exploratory to predictive models. And the predictive, I don't mean that, that you have to have a training set that incorporates all possible situations, but that you know the principles that underlie the generalization. So in psychology and behavioral science, information, these principles are, these approaches will be combined over time. And uh, the models that we use in psychology range from design and mechanistic models that kind of simulate what a computer might do, which may or may not be consistent with humans do, state transition model, state space representation, and all the way 
into uh, models that enable us to characterize the randomness and 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 uncertainties in in the, in the behaviors. Now, uh, let me give you some examples from psychological discrete state transition models. And these, uh, this is an example where I'm using GAME. And this is uh, our consortium for proactive care at Northeastern. Using the GAME to study, to assess memory of individuals over time and very densely sampled data. So this concentration game, most people know, the idea is you lay out cards and if you, you turn over two cards and if you match, you can you take them and the person with most cards wins. The idea is that you have to remember cards that have been seen but not matched. And so uh, you have to have that in memory. So what can happen in your memory? What, what would be the model of your memory? Let's suppose there is the, the sequence of cards, just alphabetically. Uh, and imagine that you have a memory buffer that represents the state of the memory after you've seen cards. After you've seen one card, you'd only B. After you've seen four cards, five cards, you, you have A, D, C, A, B. Now at this point, uh, when you see B and you don't get that, that means B must have been lost from memory. We don't know when, but we know that by the time of this trial, B was gone. And we use that to actually assume that there is certain loss function of memory as a function of the intervening cards. And if you do that, you can actually follow over time the loss of memory as a function of the number of intervening cards. And then you can sim for simplicity decide that if, you are, if there is a probability uh, by the way, this is this axis is probability of recalling that card correctly. Go, going if it is set it up to 0.5, then you can define that as a working memory estimate, or the estimate of the buffer size. Now, it turns out that this model is or these data are well represented for all, all subjects that we have seen by a viable survival function. So we can think of these memories as being survival and surviving in your in your memory. Um, and this is what happened when we tested about 25, 30 subjects and uh, how they differ individually for over a year of measurement. So there are quite a bit of differences between people. Some people are, don't have good memories and others uh, Others have excellent memories. The, the interesting thing is that by, you can, uh, just like we do in survival analysis, you can look at hazard function. I mean, what's the likelihood that you lose an item from memory as a function of, uh, of, uh, of time and or in, uh, intervening cards. And when there's independence on each, on each time, you can have certain given probability that uh, hazard function is straight, far, straight line. But if you, fa if you lose it faster, then it goes up. If you lose it slower, it goes below. What do you think people look like? Well, this is an uh, interesting situation. And you're really looking at the details of how these people's memories work. And understanding that helps us develop very sensitive measures of their decline. And you can see that many, about half of the subjects that we have in that study were quite doing quite well and were close to be uh, consistent with exponential decay, which is the independence. But some of them had lost a lot more, a lot faster. This player was a chance player. He obviously did not, even though she played the game, there was no uh, effect of any memory that she had. So th that's the other thing that's interesting is that you can uh, see how memory varies over time. And this is very 
looking at a year of, uh, of study, about 52, 53 weeks for one subject who played like 7,000 games or maybe more. And you can see how, how it varies over time. What's interesting is that in, uh, there was an anomaly, suddenly she remembered much more than normal. Now, when we investigated what happened, she was visited by her grandson, who was very good at this game. And that's, that's, that's the results we see. So now, so this was an example of uh, memory. Uh, another example is using Markov models or state transition models. And I mentioned this because this comes from uh, uh, the co-author on that study is, uh, is one of your uh, early le first leader of the uh, of the of this organization of our citrus. And the idea is that uh, human in order to change behavior, goes through some states like pre-contemplative when they don't think that, that it's, it's even important up to preparation action and then maintaining the change. Now, there's a transition that goes this way, but, and this is the uh, inspired by trans theoretical model who only had this, who, uh, by Prochaska, who only suggested this direction, but of course, People know that there are retroactive uh, people uh, go back to their previous state, so it's important. Now, how do we know which state there? We measure the, um, their behavior by continuous measurement, ranging from questionnaire, physical exercise, and all of those. So this is a way to be able to infer where you are and figure out the best intervention. Now, let me switch to a continuous uh, representation. And this goes back to the, uh, to the, our coaching systems. I've abstracted it a little bit more to look like it's uh, more um, sort of model-based control system. But the participant is the uh, plant that we control or help control by uh, providing just-in-time adaptive interventions and asking questions using ecological momentary assessment. Uh, now, um, we look at these responses and, and the, with their behaviors. For example, walking, which we'll talk about in a moment, and try to infer where they are on this and provide the best most effective interventions. Now, I, I this is a little bit of a digression of uh, comparing the machine learning to actually principled approaches, and you'll see why uh, why this is um, uh, actually useful analogy. Uh, there are many biological facts, uh, phenomena that are repetitive and rhythmic, and. This example is a physical example, swinging in a park. And the question is, when do you push? When do you give them input? And uh, how much? And uh, so to, to do that with standard machine learning, we would take a lot of these uh, uh, swings in different parks and look at the length of the swing, the mass, the, all kinds of other measurements that uh, that you might be interested in that would affect the oscillation frequencies and the amplitude decline. Because if you don't add any force, uh, eventually the swinging will decline to zero. So the first uh, the first shot looking at this, it looks pretty linear, right? It's probably not a bad thing. And the, it seems like the time between the peaks doesn't change very much. So that's a good thing. And so we could collect these features and then do uh, machine learning and we find multiple regression for the period. And you can see that the period is dependent on length, looks like linearly, and doesn't depend on mass very much. By the way, Galileo Galilei discovered that and, and uh, that led to building clocks 
early on in the 17th century. Um, so we can predict the, the frequency from length and, and uh, the decline looks also pretty linear. So, and in fact, it's very highly correlated. So the, the uh, regression, because R square is about 9.98 or something high. And of course, it does not, um, the length and the slope doesn't change. So the decline doesn't change depending on length for some reason. Now, suppose that we go to principles and build the differential equation. Those of you who are not familiar with differential equation, just trust me, this is incorporating physics, Newton's laws that leads to differential equation. And from that, you can actually figure out what the solution is for frequency, which is one over the period. And you can see that most of the frequency depends on length, but it's square root of length, not linear, as we were misled by the machine learning. And the, uh, the decline is exponential, and it depends on the friction and mass. So this, this kind of measurement would correct the kind of uh, uh, results we get just from, machine, from pure machine learning that have extremely good fits for machine learning. So, um, this is an argument to try to get as much principle as possible when you're going to uh, uh, try to especially intervene with individuals. And I'm gonna go through this very fast so that uh, um, we can get to the end of this. Um, the linear system that I, or linearized system, pendulum is actually not linear, but it's closed for small excursions, is actually well characterized by an autoregressive ARX system. And they are actually equivalent to these differential equations that I used to, to model that. And so the goal here and the beauty of this approach is that if you believe and you can test that the system is linear, as would be required by the ARX systems, the autoregressive regression, we would be able to come up with equations and principles that actually govern the mechanism that you are under, that you are trying to describe with the ARX. So it's not just for prediction, but also getting insights about the system. That's what's so uh, interesting about the way uh, the machine learning and principled approaches can combine and be very effective in the future in trying to estimate individuals. Now, you can derive these equations other ways. And this is a derivation that, was, that comes from uh, Rivera, uh, Daniel Rivera's group who's been working on these things 10 years. This is a model that, uh, that uh, ended up in, uh, in uh, uh, structural equation models, and you can convert under some assumptions, structural equations into autoregressive models and into differential equations, and that's what they did. And they came up with this, uh, uh, this uh, model that actually, as these differential equations. So the problem with this model is that it has like 50 variables. So you have to be careful with this. <laughs> Let's not get the, not, um, swept away by the beauty of the technical approach. You have to be very data, you have to be close to the data. And so, um, but in general, the idea of uh, doing ARX analysis if the system is linear, parameter estimation is actually very similar to what's been used in, in engineering and the systems identification. There's a whole engineering disciplines in, in that area, but we can apply it to psychology and change of behaviors. And I, I will illustrate that using uh, 
study that uh, involved a huge number of collaborators. And but the main collaborators is Pedja Klasnia, Lisa Goldsian, who is a student in Germany, Reika Kler, and many others. And uh, this is the acknowledgement to the grant from, uh, from the NIH. The idea is to focus on physical activity. And we try to get as many people as we can from all different ages, give them wearable device Fitbit to measure their steps and smartphone for data collection interactions and, and the notifications or suggestions of what to do. And participants are uh, also encouraged to enter daily activity plans and identify the source of the motivation. These are, this is an example of a data from one subject over, over almost a year. So certainly we keep them for six months. Otherwise they cannot keep their Fitbit. And the idea is to actually build a model that combines domain knowledge with, with data. And uh, it's big data for individuals, but small data in the usual big data uh, domain where uh, people look at the millions of humans. We develop a process model combined with statistical computing that gives us assessments and predictions. And that actually leads to causal explanations because explan explanatory models are often not very causal. They are ex called explanatory or causal because we cannot find any confounders, but usually are really uh, mechanistically not causal. Um, so let's look at what kind of principles we could use in making these measure, making these uh, hypotheses about walking and notification. So, first of all, is receptivity, and this is uh, this is the notion of nagging. Uh, if you nag somebody very often, you become very ineffective, and many people know that in their relationships, and. It's true for uh, for coaching as well. So in this example, and we are plotting receptivity, which is the probability of reacting to uh, to the notification as a function of frequency of uh, of each presentation. And you can see when we present those very frequently, the receptivity goes down, and when we start to sparse the, sparse, uh, separate them in time. It gets much better and they get much effective. So figuring out the optimal times to, to intervene is based on these curves that we determine from observing individuals. Perceived value also declines, but declines because you acquire a habit. And so uh, as you become more habitual, the, um, the value of the decision becomes less uh, lesser. And finally, the internet, what we call the internalization, although it's probably not, uh, not uh, uh, appropriate term, but it's the acquisition of the habit. After one year of doing this kind of activity, you pretty much want to do it every day, even if I don't send you a notification. So now we can put it into a model where we incorporate all these different parts, just like we did with the physical example of the swing, where we incorporated the weight and the friction and so on. Um, so this is the habituation. It acts as a gain control, and it the gain is reduced with frequency, but integrated over time, so that if you reduce the frequency, gain increases. The positive reinforcement is a positive feedback that uh, that increases the utility of walking and incorporate, and that is used in decision to actually walk. So by by taking these different parts, putting them all together, you can build a model that actually takes notification and social support, external motivation and internal motivation, all together and can produce estimates of the probability of walking. 
And this is exactly what Lisa did. Lisa Gotzian did for her thesis. And this is just an example of how we can take these imports that include external cues, um, expectancy, and reinforcement. And, but it turns out that context is very important. And the weekday weekend differences have to be included as an input. Otherwise, we will miss a lot of interesting behaviors. And this is the general um, uh, re result of the one, one participant. The, um, the idea here is that as we are going through this process and taking apart the results, we can actually increase our knowledge about the domain by looking how well our models represent the receptivity and internalization of these notification and decisions. So we have great hopes that this would be one way to both help people become better, uh, behave a little more healthy, and at the same time, improve our knowledge about the processes that underlie that uh, improvement. So the... Uh, what I would like to summarize with, and I just want to make sure that we have enough time for, for questions. Uh, so I've tried to go as fast as I could, which was probably too fast in some moments. But the, I hope that I imparted the need to understand what measurement is and what can we really assume and what, can, what we need to test about measurement in order to understand that we measure what we want to measure and correctly. We also argue that because of the variability of different behavioral and, and uh, emotional and cognitive states, that it is important to measure longitudinally and much faster than ever before in order to actually understand how variability determines the actual ability of humans to deal with the issues. I didn't have time, but there was, in our work on games, for example, we have discovered that actually people who have been sort of declining more to, in cognition, they had much higher variability. The decline was not hugely faster than the others, but their variability was very different. And so we expect that variability in performance, performance like interaction with computers, typing, stuff like that. And gait, gait is a very important characteristics that needs to be uh, measured in fairly detailed uh, aspects because the number of steps is not enough. You could walk slowly, you could work with large steps, you could have balanced. All of these parameters of gait are actually indicative of cognitive and sensory motor processes that underlie this complex behavior that we call gait. The statistical ma machine learning, which works wonderfully in many areas, needs to be combined with pr principles whenever we know the principles in order to. Uh, enable an individually tailored interventions. And this is about one of the key um, messages that I would like to, to, um, to impart. And uh, in the future, we are looking at ways that we could use machine learning to actually derive principles, much like all scientists 2000 years ago started developing science or how Mendeleev developed uh, the um, periodic table of elements. And uh, the other part is that the people are proposing models. If they don't make them quantitative and rigorous enough, it's difficult to say whether the models are different or not. So you have uh, in psychology, this is particularly uh, sort of a bad issue is that uh, we um, use models that have that are not specified enough 
and not specified sufficiently rigorously so they can be compared to each other. This is absolutely necessary in order to understand the distinctions between these models. And uh, there is much more to, to talk about, but I, I'm gonna stop now. I just took 40 minutes, so, um, and uh, I'm not gonna entertain questions. Oh, I, sh I, should, uh, I should probably acknowledge our collaborators. This, uh, you, this is a set of collaborators that I call one year BC. BC means before COVID and, uh, oops. And uh, this is the grant that actually uh, funded a lot of the a lot of the behavioral stuff. So thank you. Thank you, Misha. That was very in-depth and, and fascinating. And um, my brain is still getting around some of the math, but it's uh, I think it's I think it it was very interesting, especially the longitudinal approach to, to collecting the data. And um, I had a question about the putting together actual uh, projects. Like what, what do you imagine as an ideal scenario for, for collecting this data longitudinally? Where would you collect it? Um, and, and then what sort of sensors would you put in the environment? Um, you know, what, what's the vision for the actual data collection with the participants? As it turns out, we have lots of experience. So we, we started this work and I'm, can I say we, is mostly Holly Jimison and I. We started in, uh, at the turn of the century, slightly before that. And at that time, there were no wearable devices available. So we focused on home monitoring and we have installed these devices in homes that were monitoring presence and were able to infer gait, some parameters of gait, like speed of walking. <clears throat> and uh, we also, very early on, started using computers and for example the way you interact with keyboard or mouse can be used to make inferences very frequently because if you use computer every day right these data can be unobtrusively measured and of course we don't keep the material that's that's like that's private and secure right? we don't care we don't necessarily look at what's typed but just look at what letters are typed and uh, and just look at the timing of them. Um, and same thing with the mouse. Uh, as, as time went on, we were able to increase the number of uh, devices to, to phones and wearable watches. And uh, so these, de these devices are becoming much more uh, ubiquitous and uh, can mo monitor essentially continuously. In fact, um, the uh, Fitbit, measures the steps per minute for each minute. So we can, we can get that kind of density, which is kind of necessary if you wanna intervene just in time. Because if you, <laughs> I have usually meetings in the morning when the phone tells me, do you wanna go for a walk? <laughs> I get mad. I wanna know, I wanna put that message out when I know that they're not busy. Those inferences can be made by combining data from calendars and from, uh, from behaviors. So, uh, we, of course, uh, as time goes on, we expect to get more physiological data, which would avoid this uh, subjective uh, responses as much as possible, so that peop people are not taxed. And at the same time, we get a little bit more objectivity. Eventually, I imagine that something like EG will be possible in an ambulatory cell. But, uh, but that's essentially what we are trying to do when we set up monitoring at home or, or, uh, or uh, when, uh, when people are outside of home. Uh, and Holly talked about the, a lot of these sensors last couple of weeks ago, including sleep measurement. And uh, we've done a lot of work on looking at what, we, what happens when we put 
weight cells under the bed. You can make all kinds of inferences that are very interesting. So, but every one of them requires modeling to figure out how what you get is related to what you would really want to know. Great. Yeah, it's, it sounds like um, providing the right information to patients just in time or uh, individuals just in time to help monitor their own health. Um, one, one aspect of digital health is giving information to, to clinicians. So how do, you, how do you imagine taking all this information and distilling it down into to information to, to both the uh, patient as, as well as the clinician? Right, so uh, every stakeholder needs a different view of, uh, of, the, uh, of the information. So the participant is happy then to see that they, made so many steps in a day. So they will get the steps and, and if they wanted to, to know when during the day they made most of them are first, they were, that's what they get. The caregivers get uh, just uh, summaries that the participants actually walking and, and, has, uh, uh, and is doing, behaving normally. The clinicians, would get very clinically oriented uh, um, data, which is, would be looking at changes over time, uh, subtle changes. So if gait characteristic change over time, like balance, symmetry of, of walk, for example, is changing, uh, it's very important to understand that. In fact, Holly was showing uh, last uh, couple of weeks ago, uh, graphs of monitoring speed of walking over a couple of three years, and you could see the decline. There was very subtle decline. The, the patients, nor caregivers noticed, but our system did. And if a clinician knows that this is happening, they may suggest rehabilitation or something of that sort that would be very useful in slowing down decline, even if we don't have a cure. Yeah, it, it sounds like developing these models are, are going to be crucial for coming up with new interventions, right? Yes. And and the yeah. other thing is that but the sensitivities of these measures are very useful for pharma that is developing. Uh, uh, for, for one, for example, current uh, uh, diagnosis of Alzheimer's is, comes very late. By the time you score badly, po uh, poorly or below the threshold, on the mini mental state exam, everybody knows that there's something wrong. But it turns out that 10 years before that happens, there are already signs that uh, maybe you are on en route. So if the pharma can get hold of those data, maybe they can try to design drugs that would uh, address those declines much more effectively. Great. Well, I, I have one more question here um, from, a, from the audience, and they're, they're asking about inflammation and indicators of, yeah. for inflammation and how to monitor it um, and, and, and modeling and predicting disease, progression, intervention, prevention. Yes. Do you have any, any thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah, so um, any, any kind of disease that, uh, that has more rapid uh, dynamics, um, May, may reflect itself in, uh, in uh, the measurements that we make. For example, arthritis um, has, a, has an effect, but these effects have signatures. And uh, of course, if, uh, if there is a, we have not looked at information because that's, that's been difficult. We didn't have enough data and understanding, it depends what kind of information we're talking about. But, uh, but uh, we, we expect that by intensive longitudinal monitoring, it would be possible to find these signatures in these measurements. Great. And be able to inter intervene soon. Yeah, it's, it's a, it sounds like working with you know, clinicians and pharma to, to oh, take yeah. 
current clinical outcome okay. measurements me, and, and translating that towards the home. Let me uh, give you an example there. We have at one point to build a little kit for um, brushing teeth, keeping oral hygiene. Turns out that oral hygiene is extremely important because even the low level inflammation that's caused by gingivitis or some other infection in the mouth can have a huge impact on the overall health state of an individual. So understanding what's happening in the mouth is very important. We didn't have chemical way of detecting that, but we just knew the behavior uh, of, uh, of uh, individuals and help them develop better habits. Great. So I guess the takeaway on that is brush your teeth, right? So <laughs> brush your teeth. Brush your teeth. Yeah. Okay. Great. Well, well, thank you, Dr. Pavel, for uh, presenting today. I want to uh, thank everybody for tuning in. Hopefully you'll be able to join us next Wednesday, the 23rd, uh, to learn more about Project Leapfrog Takes Flight with UC Aviation Prize winner Derek Hollenbeck. Uh, who's a PhD student at UC Merced. There should be a link um, that we'll, you'll be able to link to to register. Also wanna ask you to, uh, if you're interested to connect with today's speaker, there's some information about that in the chat. And then uh, finally, I uh, wanna let you know that these research exchange webinar series are gonna be available for viewing tomorrow afternoon at uh, the YouTube link, YouTube link in the chat below. Thank you again for joining us and uh, hopefully you'll join us next week. Thank you.